Good morning, everybody. I, I, I know that this is Remembrance Day and we're going to have some sadness, but I, I would like to start the service off with a, a funny story. And I've always thought if you can't laugh at yourself. So you all know my husband back there, right? He's six foot two. He wears a 32, 34 pants. I've lost a lot of weight and I'm a 28, 28. We both have gray dress pants. So yesterday I reached into my closet and grabbed my gray dress pants and my black clerical shirt and we hung them up and we packed our underwear and everything. And at Nan and Sandy's house this morning we ate breakfast and I ran up to get dressed and uh, you might be wondering why I'm wearing jeans, which I wouldn't be caught dead, because I put on the pants and they were a 32, 34 and I could barely walk down the stairs with my husband's pants on and I said, why did you put your pants in my closet? Anyway, just a little humor to start the day. So good morning. I have a couple of announcements. Somebody say something to make fun of me. I'm sure I heard a comment. Mm -hmm. So I've been asked to read this announcement that on November 6th, this is a reminder that on November 6th is our anniversary and the rededication of the Almond's Cairn will happen next Sunday, November 13th. Uh, so please join us. And so at, at some point after the service, we'll be going out. Where is the cairn? That way or that way? That way. We'll be going out that way and we will stand around the cairn. Linda's putting together a plan and we maybe sing a song. I don't know what we're going to do, but we're going to figure it out this week. And so then we will come back in for coffee and, uh, and goodies. So don't please go outside and pray with us and then leave. Come back in and celebrate because it's our 150th anniversary, right? 100 and, oh, 196, oh, I don't know where I got 150, 196, so we're very, very old. Um, Rob wants to make an announcement. Rob always wants to say something. I'm always following you. <laughs> I love you, Rob. Seven weeks today is Christmas Day. But for many families, it's not a joyous time of year. For many years now, you, the Congregation of St. Mark's, along with support from many of our community friends, have sponsored local families with gifts from our Christmas hamper program. Last year alone, 106 families, totaling some 338 individuals, received grocery and department store gift cards and our goal this year is to provide for 100 families once again, or maybe more. These gift cards have proven to be very popular with the recipient families, as they provide for purchases tailored to each family's individual needs. While we hear many heartbreaking stories, we also hear the joy that our contributions have brought to them. We hope you will be able to continue your generous financial support to these families once again. And to this end, send your donations by cash, check, e-transfer, whatever way you give to the church. Uh, you can even put it on the, on the um, offering plates. The, the important thing is to make sure you have your name, address, all the particular information so that you can get a tax receipt. And I know all this information was on new news, but for those who don't see that, um, um, just re reply the, the way that you would normally do. Um, our gift card distribution date is Thursday, December 8th, so please forward any donations prior to this date. And on behalf of the many families this program helps, the Christmas Hamper team thanks you once again for considering your ongoing contribution to this program. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Rob. I just want to add one thing. You know, if you're, you're poor and struggling and you come to my door and you say, would you give me some food and I give you a can of tuna fish, you're supposed to be grateful and like tuna fish. What if you don't like tuna fish? There are things I don't like to eat and do I get forced to eat what I don't want to eat? When you give a person a $50 gift card for the grocery store, you're empowering them to buy what they like. And so it's not a, as much as a charity that I know what you need, but rather, I'm going to help you get what you need because you know what you need. I just wanted to add that. 
Rob, to what you're saying, that this is a very powerful program we have because it helps people at Christmas, but it empowers them to make their own choices. Hallelujah. I just have one more announcement. Um, I currently have 11 songs for the Valentine's Day concert. I really need about 14 to fill up a two-hour concert with a break in the middle. I heard a rumor that by Wednesday I'll have two more, which will be 13, so I just need one more song. If I don't get one more song, then I'll pick one. What? Oh, there you go. We have plenty. Okay. Oh, terrific. All righty. So on February 13th, you now need to put this on your calendar because now I've got the music. And I'm going to give the music to Bill, and we're going to have a great time that night. And we have other wacky plans we're going to put into place during that concert. So uh, just keep that in mind. So please don't give me any more past this week then because I have, I have plenty. Okay. Um, so we light our Christ candle. We are thankful in this autumn season of abundance for the richness of God's grace bestowed upon us in humbleness. We realize the depth of those blessings. We light the Christ candle to remind us that we are not to hide the light of Christ under a bushel basket or within the walls of a church building, but to take it out into the world so that everyone will know and experience God's love, peace, and justice. Amen. At this time, we honor the land where we gather and acknowledge that this region of Durham is part of the judiciary and treaty territory of the Mississauga of Scugog Island First Nation and the Mississauga Peoples and Treaty Territory of the Chippewa Island First Nation. We recognize and acknowledge the rich heritage of our indigenous sisters and brothers in their love of and stewardship to the land and all life upon it. Amen. Our introit, the choir is going to sing Jesus, Stand Among Us. Please join me in the call to worship. Peace be with you. In a world of war, in a world of confusion, in a world of pain, amen. Do I have any children? Oh, my apologies. It got left off my bulletin. In a world of isolation, Communion with each other. And communion with God. Let us search together. And let us Amen. We don't have any children in the congregation this morning? Then I'll just skip over the time of the children. So please join me in the opening prayer and the prayer of confession. Please pray with me. We live in times of uncertainty, holy God. And so we are filled with many questions. We confess them to you now. Questions about the meaning and purpose of life. Questions about the future of the world. Questions about the ways in which our leaders govern. Questions about the value of faith in the face of warfare and hatred, heartache and despair, pandemic and injustice. We confess our need of you we gather in worship to sense your presence among us, O oh God. We gather in worship because we cannot live alone. We gather in worship seeking a renewed sense of your spirit within us, around us, and among us. 
We gather in worship to be cajoled out of complacency and inspired to action. Lead us to the light of your truth and hope of the ages. Amen. And our first hymn this morning is Great is Thy Faithfulness, number 288. Please be seated. Now I would invite those who are going to read the names and lay the wreath to come forward. Norman Bailey, age 27. Alan Bath, age 20. G. F. Carter, age 24. Fred Elvidge, age 20. Andrew Fulton, age 20. P. 
Hogg, age 22. Russell Johnston, age 21. Frank McGrotty, age 23. David McBrien, age 32. Harvey Palmer, age 20. Victor Pogson, age 20. William Stark, age 38. Amen. I would like to take the privilege of saying two more names, not from this congregation. William H. Gibson and Alec Elliott, neither who died but came home from various wars, broken men. They shall not grow old as we that are left grow old. Age shall not weary them nor the years condemn. At the going down of the sun in the morning, we will remember them.
now Robin's going to read the scripture. A reading from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 20, verses 27 to 38. Some Sadducees, those who say there is no resurrection, came to him and asked him a question. Teacher, Moses wrote for us that if a man's brother dies, leaving a wife but no children, the man shall marry the widow and raise up children for his brother. Now. There were seven brothers. The first married a woman and died childless. Then the second and the third married her. And so in the same way, all seven died childless. Finally, the woman also died. In the resurrection, therefore, whose wife will be the woman be? For the seven had married her. Jesus said to them, those who belong to this age marry and are given in marriage. But those who are considered worthy of a place in that age and in the resurrection from the dead neither marry nor are given in marriage. Indeed, they cannot die anymore because they are like angels and are children of God, being children of the resurrection. And the fact that the dead are raised Moses himself showed in the story about the bush, where he speaks of the Lord as the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. Now, he is God, not of the dead, but of all living, for him to all of them are alive. These are the stories of the faithful. Thanks be to God. We're going to sing Immortal, Immortal, Invisible, God Only Wise, number 660, 264 in Voices United. Please be seated. The scripture that was read this morning uh, isn't really a scripture for Remembrance Day. 
But as it was being read, a sentence jumped out at me that I just want to reread for you. Indeed, they cannot die anymore because they are like angels and are children of God, being children of the resurrection. And I could help but think as I was listening to the names being read that they were children we sent to war. Old men in government send little boys off to war and it is a sin against God. And so we need to work for peace because it breaks my heart to think of little boys being sent off to war. And a 20-year-old young man is still a boy in many ways. Amen. Remembrance Day is not just a national holiday, but it's a global observance that is relevant for the whole world today. For some, it might be just a day of a war from half a century ago, but Iraq and Afghanistan have changed that now. Remembrance Day is a present tense event. It is a time to remember all who have served, the survivors and the ones who have served, keeping that many of the survivors came home broken human beings and had to live with that the rest of their lives. In Canada today, there are 750,000 veterans. 250,000 of those are of some kind of disability in some form. It has been discovered that in any war, psychiatric casualties outnumber deaths three to one, meaning that a soldier is three times as likely to become deranged as he is to become killed. This ratio was evident in both world wars and the Korean War. In 1982, when Israel invaded Lebanon, once again, psychiatric casualties prevailed at a ratio of three to one. However, this ratio is expected to change, and perhaps it has already changed as this next war ensues. It is expected that the ratio of psychiatric casualties will change from three to one to as high as 100 to one, and that's from Shepard. The incidence of PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder, is not only being seen more frequently, but so are the lasting effects of it. Broken marriages, homeless veterans, ruined lives. War has a devastating cost. In Israel, they take their graduating high school classes to the top of a craggy mountain called Masada, and there they solemnly proclaim, never again. Never again a holocaust. Never again will they be found defenseless. A nation that suffered from PTSD says to its youth, never again. Is Remembrance Day for us a never again kind of declaration? Not a never again will there be another war, but rather never again will the world be found defenseless against tyranny. 2,000 years ago, Jesus made this observation. But when you hear of wars and rumors of wars, do not be troubled, for such things must happen. But the end is not yet. Mark 13, 7, clearly never again is not yet. Clearly never again is not yet. In Romans 5, 7, Paul writes, for scarcely a righteous man will one die. Yet perhaps for a good man, someone would even dare to die. I think when Paul uses this kind of situation, but rather the man on the street kind of scenario, we will scarcely find a person who would be willing to lay down his life for a complete stranger, even though that stranger is a good person. In the military, men and women do lay down their lives for others as their training has taught them to do. They go into harm's way with a sense of duty, if necessary, even the ultimate duty. In fact, the word righteous that Paul can, uses can also have the meaning innocent. And often 20-year-olds are innocent and naive. The word good can also have the connotation of worthy, upright, or honorable. It is for the innocent and the honorable that soldiers fight. But to leave these comments here would be a glorification of war. The writer of the book of James says, where do wars and fights come from among you? Do they not come from your desires for pleasure? 
that war in your members. So though we wage war for the freedoms of our nations and the safety of our peoples, there is also this other reason of self-pleasure, perhaps the wealth, the power, the politics that are stained into the cause. I think that Remembrance Day is not just about military campaigns and the people who have sacrificed their lives. It certainly includes civilians like those in the Merchant Marine. It includes others who are serving from a position of duty like firemen, nurses, and police officers have given of themselves for the innocent and the upright. But perhaps the greatest purpose behind Remembrance Day is the call to remember that when each of us there is the capacity to do wrong and to harm others, to move for the purposes of self-pleasure. You'll remember the story about Yael Dainur, a Jewish man who survived the concentration camps, who then came to testify at the trial of Adolf Eichmann. As Dainur walked down the aisle of the courtroom and saw for the first time in years the Eichmann that had imprisoned him, now himself a prisoner behind bulletproof glass for his protection, Dainur collapsed. And as the judge asked him if he was overcome by the anger he had for his enemy, Dainur shook his head and said, when I see him sitting there, I just realize that he's no different than I. Perhaps Remembrance Day is an opportunity to caution ourselves against the foolishness of sin that resides in each of us. Paul says that scarcely, scarcely will someone die for the innocent or righteous. And perhaps for a good or upright person, somebody might even dare to die. In other words, we will lay down our lives only if the cause is worthy. It's what Paul says next that rocks the boats in Romans 5. He says, but God demonstrates his own love towards us. In that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. When worthiness was not on the table... In fact, it was the opposite of worthiness. The term sinners implies those who are against God at enmity with him. When we were not worthy in any sense of the word, Jesus Christ died for us. It is possible that all our attempts at justice and compassion are really pictures of the compassion and justice that God exercised when he had his son lay down his life for us. He paid the price of our sin that we would arrive at the real meaning of innocent and worthy. Today, we remember that there is nothing glorious about war other than when it is over. Today, we remember those from us and those among us who pursued hope and faced fears and carried its scar that we might live as we are, even to the freedom of this Remembrance Day service. Amen. There's only one thing I, I want to add to this, that last night Nan and Sandy and Don and I watched a story um, by, um, help me out, what's his name? Oh, Sachinina, what's his first name? Omar. Omar Sachinina, who had Christmas dinner with us many, 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 many years ago because I called the TV station for some reason and discovered in the conversation that his parents were in New York and he was alone for Christmas for the first time and I said, well, what are you going to do for Christmas? He said, well, I'm a Muslim, I don't celebrate Christmas. I said, yes, but you have to eat. He said, well, that's true. And he came to our house and we had dinner together with him. And I've watched him over the past 10 years grow and become the, the sort of superstar that he is. He created a show and took his mother back to Uganda 50 years after she had to get away from Idi Amin. It was an excellent show. He did an excellent job of not making it sappy and romantic. And, and we have been to Uganda, and it looked just like it was when we were there. But watching his mother reconnect and watching him reconnect and then showing the pictures of Idi Amin and telling us how many people Idi Amin killed, half a million people he killed. This is what war does. This is what despots do. And what Jesus says to us is our job is to remember. Our job is to make peace. We have to make peace. Amen. Our offering hymn is praise God from whom all blessings flow.
Gracious and loving God, you call us to be peacemakers, especially on this day when we remember all of the ways that we have sinned as governments of the past hundreds of years. So bless these gifts that we may use it to bring peace in our place and that around the world churches are also praying for peace. In the name of the risen Christ, amen. Please be seated. Let us pray. Gracious and loving God, on this day when we remember the sadness of the past and the sadness of a present, our hearts are filled with grief for those boys, those young men who have left us and will never come back. For those young boys who left us and came back terribly broken so that they couldn't live a normal life. We pray for those places in the world where people are still killing each other, where people are starving to death because of dictators. And there are so many, God, I probably will miss half of them. Syria, Iraq, Iran, Afghanistan, Northern Korea, Israel, the Palestinians, and a whole bunch more that I've probably forgotten about. But God, you know, we know. Fill our hearts with your spirit, God. Fill our hearts with your sense of peace and fill our hearts with your courage that we may stand up and say peace is the only way to solve problems. That we might stand up for justice Justice for people who don't look like us. Justice for indigenous people. Justice for people in other countries. Justice for poor people. Justice for children. Justice for all who are being hurt in some way. And we go, we pray for those who are sick, who are shut in, who are lonely, who are alone, and for those that risk their lives every day. We pray all of this in the name of the risen Christ, and we pray together using the words that Jesus taught his disciples and also taught to us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. My brothers and sisters in Christ, you are all called to be peacemakers, so leave this place and go out into your lives with the gift of peace for all that you meet. Amen. Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord's face shine upon you. May the Lord be gracious unto you. May the Lord grant you peace now and forever. Amen. Amen.